Hello, people of the internet. My name is Johnny, and welcome back to another reaction video. Today, we're going to be looking at part two of Matt Pat's latest FNAF 7, aka Five Nights at Freddy's VR, aka FNAF Help Wanted Theory. What do you want, Riley? I'm recording. Go away! <laughs> I'll cut that out. Don't worry. So I actually missed the part in his last theory talking about the second theory part two to it. So I missed that. But thanks to you guys, I know about it now. And even if I didn't, it's here. So I'm going to be reacting to that. My problem with the theory last time was that it didn't fit the timeline he created because FNAF Help Wanted, in my opinion, the gameplay is not going to be canon anyways um, because we're going to location to location with all the animatronics. In my mind, it's kind of like Custom Night where the gameplay is not canon and it will never be canon because you can't have all the characters in location all at the same time. Um, but it'll have lore sprinkled into it for, obviously, the theorizers of the FNAF community. Um, and even if it is canon, it wouldn't fit the timeline, because we see FNAF 3 take place in the game. FNAF 3 is, like, near the end of the timeline, while Sister Location, which has the technicians that MatPat thinks is going to be the repairman in this game, is, like, one of the first locations. And they die in this location, so th that was my problem with his theory last time. I didn't address it because I wanted to make sure that my idea was right, and it is. So, yeah, that's why I'm just a teeny bit confused. But hopefully, this theory is going to make, I don't know, maybe it'll change my mind. Maybe I'll agree with Matt Pat, and just because I disagree with him doesn't mean I hate him. It's my reaction, it's my opinion. That's kind of the reason why I'm doing this, and for me at least, when I watch reactions, I'm looking for their reaction and for the person's opinion on the video, rather than, you know, argue with them like, Oh, well you can't disagree with Matt Pat, he's like the smartest guy ever. It's my opinion, guys, so calm down. Alright, anyways, let's just, let's just react to it. I've been talking a lot. Scott's problem with fan art. We cover a lot of scary stuff on this show, but today is, no clickbait, the scariest topic of all. Copyright. With a little dose of FNAF, all my favorite topics in one episode. I love 2019. Ha, ha, look, it's, it's the Pew News intro, but it's game theory. Pat News. Pat Hello, news. Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, where today, call me Gloria Bolger, because our top Bolger. story is an oopsie. One big oopsie made by one big man. Actually, I don't know what his relative size is. He's just big in the gaming space. It that is. man's name is Scott Coffin. Now, if you're not familiar with what happened, let me catch you up. Last episode, we analyzed a teaser image for Scott's new VR game. So, I'm still... I'm slightly confused about where this theory is heading. I should probably just watch it and find out what it's about. But is this a continuation of the last one, or is it a separate one talking about copyright? I don't know, let's watch. Game FNAF Help Wanted. What I didn't mention in that video, though, was that it was only online for just a couple of hours. In fact, by the time I had gotten to check out this thing, it had been wiped clean from the internet. Only preserved thanks to some dedicated Redditors, specifically GB Aura Recharged. Now, Scott is no stranger to posting things only to rip them off the internet later. He's done it with comments on my videos. He did it with version one of FNAF World. His contents yeah. of the infamous FNAF 4 box, yep, those got changed. Heck, even the script for his new movie was written, approved, and ready to shoot. It's because he, he wants to make it, it out. good. Like, this community deserves better. But this time, it was different. This time, it was because the team working on the VR game, Steel Wool, had unintentionally used fan art. As he said on Reddit, quote, My first teaser in more than half a year was made using questionable choices at best and traced fan models at worst. 
He then went on two days later to clarify. Huh. So it appears, Matt, you do actually look at Reddit. Kind of strange, because you missed a whole lot of things that Scott said on Reddit in the last theory. Just, just saying. Further, quote again, as you all remember, the artwork that I teased for the game, which was actually a portion of the cover artwork, included characters that had used fan art and fan models as references. When I learned about that, I was obviously pretty upset and took down the teaser. The person working on the artwork used images that he thought were mine. If anything, everyone who had one of their models referenced should pat themselves on the back, because your models look like they were canon. I think it's a testament to the fan community that the fan models rival models. Many of them looked identical, and some of them look better. So the TLDR of this whole thing is that he pulled down the teaser because it used recolored, reskinned models made by a fan of characters that Scott Cawthon himself created that looked so close to the original creation that his own team couldn't tell him apart from the originals. And this sparked a really interesting question in my head. Did Scott legally have to do this? These are his characters, after all. And the fan-made models were so close that they probably wouldn't have been seen as any sort of transformative use. Now, obviously, he cares about this community a lot, and pulling the teaser was absolutely the correct decision from a goodwill standpoint, but what would the law say about this? After doing the research, it's a lot more so this is about copyright and interesting than you might think. To get there, we're going on a twisted copyright journey that'll show us why Naughty Dog lives up to its name, why your photographs of the Eiffel Tower are probably illegal, and why everyone's in an at least at night, right? About Rule 34. Oh boy, welcome online. Copyright law done know what's hitting it. That's a terrible last line. Oh boy, copyright law doesn't know what's hitting it. Copyright law don't have a an indicator <laughs> just gonna segue over to the next paragraph oh and uh before we dive into this episode you, you might have noticed that i actually released another video alongside this one today i did notice in that that upload i specifically talk about this channel and a lot of our own personal issues that we've had with fan art in the past as well as a way to protect yourself if you're a fan artist who's working online right now it's actually a really important video for me, touching on a topic that I've stayed r really quiet about for quite a long time. So before you go down into the comments and start laying into me for not being allowed to cover this issue because I supposedly stole fan art in the past, please go watch that video too. That's actually I why I'm not be reacting upload. to that I video. I couldn't really decide which one made more sense to go first because really the two complement each other. They comment off of each other. So just please watch good plug <laughs> sorry cool. i've been i so that was something i got called out upon in the last video but can you blame matt pat for doing this and i know it seems mean to say but you know i know he knows that his fnaf videos get a lot of attention heck his last one was number one on trending for like the day for like one day so he knows they get a lot of attention. So plugging things like his merch, his other videos, his channel and all that stuff in the FNAF video that's getting a lot of attention is pretty clever. It'll do me a favor. It'll save me a lot of grief when I read the comments in this. Save my save my self-esteem a lot of grief as well. Oh, uh, the other disclaimer that I should mention at the beginning of this episode is that there's a lot of fan work out there that is transformative, that is not considered to be a copy of anyone else's work. This episode actually isn't about that. Today, we are purely focused on fan art that's intended to closely represent a character that already exists and all the basic legal mumbo jumbo that's around that. So, we all on the same page? We all good? Hopefully. Great! Let's get into it. Let's get do we can do. Now, Scott is far from the only game maker that's that had a, a copyright agency when it comes to teasing a new game. Case in point, the original version of the trailer for Uncharted 4 A Thief's End was released containing a painting that took images from Assassin's Creed Black Flag's concept art. The, the one with the pirate. I gotta give credit where credit's due here, guys. That is incredibly on brand. Dealing artwork to promote a game that has the word thief in the title. Very smart. Very <laughs> meta. 
Ubisoft wasn't appreciating that level of meta commentary though, and Sony was quick to pull the video and replace the asset. Oopsies like this also aren't just limited to marketing materials and teasers Oopsie either. Time. Back in 2013, a graphic designer named Cameron Booth made a post announcing that he was effing furious with the fact that the game The Last of Us featured a map that he had made of the Boston Metro. First off, I'd like to point out that The Last of Us, just like Uncharted, is a Naughty Dog game. I guess we know what the naughty is referring to in their name. But oh, after oh, what oh. I assume was a swift apology and a fairly decent payoff, Cameron quickly dialed back his language in a later public post saying, it seems as if matters will be resolved to everyone's satisfaction shortly. Great, I'm so happy for you guys. Money truly heals all wounds. But this case already starts to reveal some weird nuances of the copyright world because while the graphic designer who made the picture owns the copyright to his map and was absolutely in his right to complain about the improper usage, he actually doesn't have the copyright to the Boston Metro itself. Does that sound dumb? You bet it does. Kind exactly. of. It's so dumb that it can't be anything ads other than real real world pieces of architecture are subject to their own copyright just like one musician can't copy the song of another musician so too an architect can't copy the building design created by another architect things get even weirder though when you start thinking about what this means for pictures that people are taking in front of buildings those pictures technically are violating copyright or at least they would be if it wasn't for this idea of freedom of panorama you see most countries have some law or general understanding in place that says you won't get sued if you decide to create an Instagram story showing yourself posing in front of some famous landmarks. Notice though that I said most countries. Most does not equal all. Case in point. You heard it here, folks. First, not first, most does not equal all. Amazing. I'm so, so happy that that was cleared up. France. France doesn't have freedom of panorama. As a result, technically speaking, you legally shouldn't be able to post photographs of the Eiffel Tower, but only the night photographs. You see, because the Eiffel Call Tower that. without lights was built in 1889, that one is old enough to have entered the public domain. But the lights that go on at night were installed in 1985, thereby making this an artistic work with live copyright, making posting photos of it illegal. That means that anything you find in a regular Google image search under Eiffel Tower at night was probably taken by fearless outlaws who are flouting the law, throwing caution to the wind, and posting their tourist photos of the Eiffel Tower in the evening. Probably a bunch of developers at Naughty Dog being like, whatever, we don't care. We steal artwork all the time. We're Naughty Dog. We're dogs who are naughty. So what does the Eiffel Tower have to do with FNAF fan art? Well, obviously people are- t I mean, we are about <laughs> nearly halfway through the video, so tell us, Matt. Taking photos of the Eiffel Tower and art getting thrown in Le Prison. I actually didn't learn the word for prison when I took French. And that's because these crazy laws don't matter for people who are only using the image for personal consumption. You put an image on your fridge or you slap it on the desk at your office, you're fine. But the second you publish that image, it becomes a different story. Just take a look at any stock image website like Getty Images, which is a business built on legally owning the rights to every image.
image in their archive, and you'll notice that most of the images of the Eiffel Tower, even the ones with low light, don't feature the lights on the building turned on. And this is where things get tricky as if they weren't overly complicated enough. You see, if you publish a piece of artwork that features a character like Mangle or Mario or Mewtwo or heck, Elsa, and you don't own the copyright to that character, then publishing that fan work is technically a copyright violation, which merits a huge question, what counts as publishing? Now, obviously, publishing includes things like putting it in a book that ends up in Barnes & Noble, but publishing actually has a much broader definition in the legal sense. Publishing in the broadest sense of the word just means causing something to become public or making it publicly known. That means really? that everything from printing up and handing out a bunch of flyers on the street to, you guessed it, posting it online is covered. It doesn't even matter if it's a non-commercial type of posting. Posting fan art non-commercially on your blog or a site like Tumblr or Instagram or Twitter all count as publishing that image. And if you're thinking to yourself, wow, that affects a lot of people, yeah, it does. You're yeah. absolutely right. Technically speaking, every fan artist on Tumblr and DeviantArt and Pinterest and Pixiv and their own independent blog, they are I've technically violating copyright every time they post a new sketch of an existing character that's not transformative enough to be considered fair use. I know! I know that sounds unbelievable and that every fan artist out there is lighting their torch and rummaging for their proverbial pitchfork to come after me right now. But first off, don't kill the messenger here, guys. Legally, this is the truth based on the lawyers that I've spoken with and the legal papers that we've read. That is the letter of the law. But the letter is obviously only half the story, considering, of course, that the prison's... <laughs> It's also half the video. <laughs> ...across the country aren't filled with Rainbow Dash fan artists and bendy bottlers. Though it'd be pretty funny if they were. What are you in for? Killed a guy. You? I drew a pink pony very accurately. In actual practice, the situation favors fan artists a lot more than you might first think. As you can see pretty much everywhere on the internet, it's really rare for copyright holders to try and enforce their copyright. The only instances where you see this actually happen tend to be when a brand feels that the art that's being made really misrepresents their IP. One really convenient example of this in the gaming world is Blizzard, who issued DMCA takedowns across a bunch of different fan art in efforts to stop people from making um, how do I put this nicely? Yeah, yeah. Renditions of Overwatch characters in uh, compromising situations. Oh. Loving each other just a bit too oh. much for their liking. For those of you who have the foreign tongue, images of their characters in flagrante delicto in the carnal embrace tranquility. Basically, Blizzard wanted people to skip from rule 33 to rule 35 of the internet handbook, if you catch my drift. And you can imagine just how effective Blizzard was at accomplishing that goal. Not that I would know personally, I was just doing research. Uh -huh. For a friend. Anyway, according to the guidelines from Blizzard's policy on sure. creations, they cracked down in order to, quote, maintain and protect the image of their games. They also said, Blizzard requires that productions maintain the T rating that has been given to its products by the ESRB. And I get that, right? It makes sense. Well, it might have been kind of a futile effort to remove sexy time from the internet. Legally speaking, they're entirely within their legal right to protect their brand. But speaking of legal rights, it is a two-way street. Even though a company owns the rights to its characters, you, as the fan artist, own the right to your individual piece of fan art. So going all the way back to our example of FNAF fan art, which there's a lot out there, if you drew yep. a picture of Freddy and the Cupcake, what are the actual rights for that image? Well, Scott owns the copyright to the character, but you, you own the copyright to that specific image. So you can't publish it. You don't own the rights to the character. Scott but can. Scott also can't publish that oh. image because he doesn't have the rights to your oh, artwork. I you get are it. both caught. As it turns out, no one really has the rights to publish that image. Unless, of course, you both agree to it, but good luck there. <laughs> Scott doesn't talk to anyone. Hey, Scott, it's mad. Except for Docco. Yeah. Probably a secret son. I don't know. Talks to Docker like all the time. <laughs> Honey's a free browser <laughs> That's true.
Now, what would have happened if Scott hadn't owned up to his oopsie and the situation had actually escalated? Oops. What could the fan artist who created those character models have done to him? Turns out, a very similar issue has come up and was settled in a fairly famous case with the iconic Obama hope image from that election. The artist of the famous Obama image, Shepard Ferry, who is actually one of my favorite street artists, created the artwork, <laughs> but he copied the image from a photograph. Oh my god. Lag. Don't worry, I am back. Of Obama that he, quote, found on the Obama image, Shepard Ferry, who is actually one of my favorite street artists, created the artwork, but he copied the image from a photograph of Obama that he, quote, found on the internet, but it was owned by an independent photographer from the Associated Press. In court, the ruling was that the Hope artwork infringed on the copyright of the original photograph. The original owner of the photograph now participates in all money that's earned by the rights to that image. This is also the one case where I'll actually mention fair use because Shepard Ferry actually tried to make the argument that his work here was transformative, but the court didn't buy it. In fact, he almost went to jail for it. The upshot of this whole thing is that, in theory, if a legal fight like this one would have happened in Scott's case, it could have very easily landed both parties in court, and it would have actually been pretty hard for Scott to win. Luckily, oh, Scott. none of that happened. And I think a lot <sighs> of that is because Scott holds himself to a higher standard and wouldn't have wanted <sighs> to do a disservice to his fans. As he said in his Thank apology, you. quote, the only thing I care about is doing right by this community. Good on you, man. But there is another compelling reason for Scott to take that teaser down. Money. You see, the other big complicating factor in all of this isn't whether someone is really infringing on their copyright, but whether they're I think he's talking about the thing he's trying to get from this video. In the United States, criminal copyright laws prohibit you from actually using someone else's That was a joke, don't get mad. Your own Right, but whether they're actually making money while doing the infringing. In the United States, criminal copyright laws prohibit you from actually using someone else's intellectual property for your own financial gain. This means that when you post your fan art online, you're not going to face any criminal liability. Fan artists, you are good to go. Sketchy nerd t-shirt companies that are selling unlicensed Nintendo merch, though, you might not be so safe. Stop! You violated the law. Pay the court a fine or serve your sentence. Likewise, if you're selling your own posters of your fan art images, well, that could land you in some legal hot water as well. And I know that this is the most sensitive subject around fan art because of all the commission that artists earn by doing fan art made to order for other members of their fan communities. I'm not condemning anyone. I'm not passing any sort of judgment on anyone else's online business. As someone who uses a lot of online images of other people's IP, I'm kind of digging my own grave here as well. This whole topic just makes me uncomfortable. Especially since that's still not the end of this whole story. Because we There's still have like still five minutes left. There's a couple of ways that you could actually be sued even if you did commercialize your fan art. The company would need to show in court that your art had damaged their company in some way. Using the naughty Overwatch picture example again, if I can. If Blizzard took the fan artist's court, they would need to prove that somehow this adult-only content had damaged their 
their brand in some way. In their case, Blizzard is trying to market their game Overwatch as a family-friendly experience for all players ages 13 and over. And so the brand may actually get hurt if the first thing that comes up when mom starts Googling Orisa is a bunch of this very family unfriendly images. How much though? It's actually hard to tell. Well, it seems like they would actually have a good case. It's still really hard to quantify how much their brand would get hurt by stuff like this, which is blurry behind me. For your safety, I swear. Your safety is my primary concern. And that's a pretty clear cut case here. In most instances, fan art doesn't compete with the official images from the game. So what does all of this mean for you, the fan artist? Well, it means that oh, you no. probably don't have to worry about getting sued. And even if you are getting close to getting sued, you're probably gonna know that you're doing something wrong long before anything happens. Like in 2015, the Pokemon company went after a cafe that ran a Pokemon party unofficially at PAX that promoted itself using Pikachu posters and charged an entry fee. Or in another case, a woman was threatened legal action from 20th Century Fox because she was selling a Firefly themed hat on her Etsy store. So long story short, just don't charge admission to your next Pokemon themed birthday party and leave the Firefly apparel for Hot Topic. But to bring it all the way back around to FNAF one last Finally. time, while Scott doesn't stand to gain a whole lot by suing his fans over their creations, he does stand to lose a whole lot if he uses a fan-made model in the box art for a VR game that is for profit and could potentially make millions of dollars. See, if he kept those fan models in his box art, it would, in theory, open him up to a much bigger legal problem where he might have to pay thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars in royalties simply for using those two pieces of artwork. So Scott's decision to take down the teaser image was certainly the right thing to do from a moral perspective, but it's also the correct thing to do from a business perspective. I mean, don't get me wrong, Why Scott fun? is all about giving back to the FNAF community, but maybe he's not interested in giving that much back. But hey, that's just a theory and certainly not legal advice. Consider this your official legal disclaimer that I am not a lawyer, end. even though we talked to a lot of lawyers for this episode. And if you get yourself into hot water for making or distributing fan art, you can use this video as an interesting talking piece with your legal counsel, but the judge don't will watch it. assume All of that it. I, Matt Pat, will be standing All up for you in court minutes. as your legal defense. Here, watch this YouTube video about FNAF fan art. No, it's not really gonna work, okay? Okay, keep farting it up out there, guys. And remember, that is just a theory, a game theory. Thanks for watching. Yeah, I've got a how to put the logo in the FNAF house so you may forget that this was even a FNAF theory at all. This, this face, this is the face that you will see in the thumbnail. Cause that is my, this is my accurate representation of how I feel right now due to this video. <laughs> it barely had anything to do with FNAF. I swear he talked about Blizzard and Overwatch more than he talked about FNAF. He very well could have made it about Blizzard and Overwatch and their situation, but because it's FNAF, it's going to get more attention, it's going to get him more money. Isn't that the whole point of this video? <laughs> he was talking about business, he was talking about money. He was actually talking about himself, that's the big plot twist of this video. Yep, that was actually him all along. And I know, I don't even care that I'm going to get hate about this. This was by far one of the clickbaitiest things I've ever seen on FNAF. And the worst part was that it was MatPat. It was freaking MatPat. <laughs> like, come on. Be haters. Listen, you've probably clicked off the video by now, but if you're still here for some reason, listen. He talked about Overwatch so much and how the like the rule 34 fan art of overwatch could ruin their company he had some pretty good pretty good cases about that right and he totally could have made the video about that but because of fnaf's latest game and the situ obviously it's a perfect situation and i guess it, it's a good follow-up to the last theory but because it's fnaf 
he knows he's going to get more attention from this. And because it's Scott we're talking about, he knows he's going to get more attention. It just, if you think about it, it makes sense. Of course he made this video about FNAF. And I hate to be, again, I love MatPat. I love what he does. He's super smart. He's awesome. He's done, like, he did a charity live stream, like, maybe half a year ago. That was awesome. I watched it all the way through. It was amazing. He raised a lot of money. But you gotta understand, he still runs a business. YouTube. He works on YouTube. That's his job on YouTube. When it's your job, you have to make money. That's literally the definition of a job. You work and you get money. This is his job. And when you know that you can do something, when you know that you can do something that'll get you more attention and more money, you take it. You, like, you obviously take it. I'm, this isn't a stupid, like, it makes sense. I'm not just saying this so I can be that guy out there that's like, oh, this video's stupid. It's not stupid. It's a pretty good video. It had great points, and the concept was awesome. I think, you know, he did a great job spreading the word about copyright and all that stuff. But because it's FNAF, he, he like, I'd say maybe a quarter of that video was talking about FNAF. He also finally mentioned Reddit and Scott and his conversations on Reddit. He finally mentioned that. But why didn't he mention it? Because it suits the video's plot and what he's trying to get across. He didn't do it in the last theory. He didn't bring up the timeline in the last theory because it doesn't make any sense. But this time he brought it up because it's Scott and people are worried about him. People are worried he might go to jail. People are worried he might get sued. You know, all that stuff. I hate to be this guy, but it makes sense. You're welcome, haters. Leave leave a dislike on this video. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I You can tell that I didn't really like this video much. Just because he made it, he made it seem like there was going to be more FNAF in it. I thought this was going to be a follow-up to the last theory and have more evidence about the last theory. But nope. It was barely even about FNAF. Anyways. <laughs> I think I think I've done my poet. I think I've made my point. Anyways. <laughs> I'm going to go. Leave the haters in the comment section. And I'll see you all on the flip side. Goodbye.